Monday, October 20th. I know I've been away for several broadcasts, and it's nice to be back. I was teaching my private citizenship course in West Palm Beach, and the following weekend in Atlanta, Georgia. So I appreciate your prayers in this because the need and the interest in this is growing. And so we pray that uh, the Lord would bless in his teaching that all of us can become pre-1933 private citizens of the United States of America. You see, my friend, the problem today, politically speaking, is the Pope's New World Order. The problem, politically speaking, spiritually speaking, of course, is refusal to believe the gospel, refusal to repent of sin, which most of us white men are guilty of, as this ministry is primarily to preach to and for for white men. And that's our problem. Our problem is we don't want to repent because we can. Jesus Christ said to his own brothers, he says, your, your time is any time. You can repent any time you want to. And you can believe the gospel any time you want to. Problem is you don't want to repent, and problem is you don't want to believe, and so God has to give his elect special grace to repent and to believe. But the problem, but the, the truth is you can repent any time you want to. Christ said to his own brothers and sisters, your time is always ready. And that's our problem. We refuse to repent. Okay. Don't want to repent? which is part and parcel of believing the gospel. You don't repent first and then believe. That repentance and belief are simultaneously, it's one act. And if you don't want to truly repent of your sins and believe the gospel, why then you're going to have to bear the responsibility of refusing the propitiation, the reconciliation, the redemption that God has provided in His beloved Son, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, seated at His right hand, expecting His enemies to be made His footstool, which is going to happen in the not-too-distant future. He said in the book of Revelation, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me. Behold, I come quickly. He's coming quickly. We're here today and gone tomorrow. We're a little a flower that blooms and then we die and fall away. That's, that's the flesh. That's humanity. One generation lives and, and uh, is born, lives and dies, while another one follows and it continues on generation after generation. Yet the Lord said, I, Behold, I come quickly. Compared to eternity, <laughs> yeah, I come time as quickly. But the problem with us white men is we refuse to repent and believe the gospel, and so therefore we get worse and worse. I see more tattooed, pierced white men than I've ever seen in my life. It's disgusting. That's right. It's disgusting. It's unbiblical. It's ungodly. It's marking up your bodies. And the Bible forbids it for the nation of Israel. You're not pierce yourselves, you're not going to tattoo yourselves. There was a time in this country when very few men had tattoos, and they were, they were Marine Corps guys, they were in the military, but the average civilian, he never had tattoos. My grandfather, Callan, had one on his arm, and he said, Eric, don't you ever get one. But apart from that, you didn't see this tattooed fanaticism we see today because the white people in this country are becoming more savage and savage and savage and deserve a savage military government that will not acknowledge any rights. The problem is spiritual, first and foremost. Acts 17.30, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. He's commanded all men everywhere to repent. He wouldn't command you to repent if you couldn't. He's commanded all men everywhere to repent in Acts chapter 17 because he says that in Acts 17 verse 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The apostle Paul is preaching to Gentiles, preaching to Greeks of Mars Hill. Repentance is not just for the Jew, it's for the Gentile too. He's commanded all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness 
That's the second coming by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. There's an empty tomb outside of Jerusalem. And we better take account of it. The tomb is empty. Josephus, the great Jewish historian of the first century, said that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah of Israel and rose from the dead. He says on about page 535 or so of his Antiquities of the Jews. That's a, that's a historian apart from the Bible. Tacitus, a Roman, a Roman historian, validates the life that Jesus of Nazareth really lived. He really lived. This is no fairy tale. And he really died, he was really crucified, and he really rose from the dead. Because I guarantee you that if he wouldn't have risen from the dead, they'd have opened up that tomb after three or four days and paraded his body in the streets of Jerusalem and said, Look, he's not risen from the dead. He was a liar, he's a deceiver, and he said he'd rise from the dead, and here's his body. But guess what? They couldn't find it. It was gone. And according to the Bible, the leading Jewish leaders gave money to the Roman soldiers, said, Just tell him that his, that his disciples came and took the body, whatever. Or if you're going to be Opus Dei boys, yeah, the, the Jesus really didn't die, and he married Magdalene, and he went off to France and followed a whole Merovingian bloodline. I mean, it's craziness. He died, and he was buried. He was deader than a hammer, and he rose from the dead on the third day, and he's now at the right hand of his Father, God Almighty, expecting his enemies to be made his footstool. And you, my friend, had better be concerned about all your sins that you're going to be brought into judgment for unless you believe the gospel. Couldn't care less about the church you go to. Couldn't care less if you were baptized. Couldn't care less what you've done. All your righteousness are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. And that Hebrew word for filthy rags is the rags of a menstruous woman. Bloody. Disgusting. All your righteousness are bloodies and disgusting. According to God. Because when you say you have your own righteousness, you're saying you're telling God you don't need his righteousness. You don't need his son's righteousness. You don't need the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to your account. Because you're going to stand before God just like Cain. And I went and I planted the fruit of my garden, God. And you ought to accept my fruit of my labor, my hands here. I don't want to sacrifice any lamb. I don't want to cut the throat of any lamb and offer blood to you. You bloody God. You and your bloody religion. Accept my good works. And the Lord said to Cain, I'm not accepting it. And you need to go out and do what your brother did. And if you do, I will accept them. I will accept them. And so as a result, we need to repent and truly believe the gospel and be born again. Otherwise, we stand before God in our own quote-unquote good works in the work of our hands. I gave a million dollars to charity, or I gave to the to the Pope's United Way, or I gave to the Pope's uh, can't war on cancer, I gave to the Pope's uh, philanthropies, because they all belong to the Pope, you know. And I was a good... Roman Catholic were going to the Baptist church. I did all the Catholic things the preacher told me to do because after all whatever he says that's going to get me to heaven. What is the difference between all these Baptists and Protestants today? they are all got their military flags flying in their churches and they're all look at their preachers that there's some kind of a Pope. What does the Bible really say, Holy Father? That's why God gave it to us in our English language. In the AV 1611 we don't need to ask anybody what it means. Problem is, we all act like we're incompetent wards of the state. We do what men tell us to do, and there is no fear of God before our eyes, white men. That's because we won't repent and believe the gospel, because when we do that, we now will fear the Lord and do what's pleasing to Him. We'll be back in a few moments after prayer and meditation. Here, 24 7 World Radio. We're listening to 24 7 World Radio.
world order. We need to repeat that in our minds over and over again. It's the Pope's new world order as he is overseen by the Black Pope, the Jesuit Superior General, Commander-in-Chief of the Military Marine Corps, known as the Society of Jesus, the Light Horse of the Pope. Those military men, in fact, I saw one getting off a plane when I came back from Atlanta yesterday, or the day before yesterday, and uh, he was in his a Jesuit coming from Atlanta to Harrisburg, and there he was in a Cossack, a Cossack. A black robed tall white man short cropped hair thick he could be a soldier he could be anything without that cassock on you see those guys regard us as nothing but a bunch of slaves you realize that the top Jesuits regard us as nothing but a bunch of slaves the goy, the animals, for them to use for their purposes of restoring the Pope's temporal power around the world. You think in religion? You think believes that you have the right to believe what you believe in God? Do you believe that, sir? You hide the skin. If you look at the papal flag, there are two keys on it. One is the golden key and the other is the silver key and they're crossed in the center. They meet. They're not separate one from another. They're united. And that golden key symbolizes the temporal, the, the spiritual power of the Pope. That means that the Pope believes and preaches and has imbibed in him from the doctrines of Rome since 606 A.D., A.D. 606, when the Temple of Power was given to the Pope by that bloodthirsty fanatic Pepin, or pardon me, a, a focus. That's when the Pope was given his you know, polit- uh, spiritual power. That means that every human creature is to be subpatient, explicitly stated in that blasphemous bull, Unum Sanctum, by Boniface the Third, when he said that besides the creature, he said to the Roman note, get out the bull, Unum Sanctum. It was by universal temporal politics. Now, do you expect the Roman Catholic institution by a real political figurehead called the Pope of Rome, who's the king? Do you like that, that he believes that he can tell you what to believe about God? If you don't like that, then you need to resist it. If you think you have the freedom to believe about God what you want to believe, then you need to resist the Pope. It's not live and let live for him, man. It's either do what I say or suffer and die. Why do you think those Croatian Eustachy killed what? A million, killed over a million Orthodox Christian people in Serbia. Why do you think they did that? Convert or die, boy! 